Um, welcome to the 2024 ESE Town Hall meeting. My name is Annette Herminghouse, and I'm with the Energy Science and Engineering Department here in the Stanford Door School Sustainability at Stanford University. Um, I am going to be handling the technical aspects of this meeting. So if you have any technical questions, you can put them in the chat. Otherwise, uh, all other questions will be handled at the end. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Professors Warren Court and Kieran Pondy. Hey, thank you, Annette. Um, uh, thank you for, for doing this and, and uh, making it all work. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this town hall event. My name is Warren Court, and I teach in the Department of Energy Science and Engineering in the Dewar School of Sustainability at Stanford. So our courses are concentrated on the study of resources and the school endeavors to include sustainability principles in, in our teaching and research. Uh, the town hall event is part of a class, Energy 167-267, um, on the valuation of energy resources. So our students spend a lot of time attending class, writing, doing research, computational analysis, but they don't often have the opportunity to speak in public. So this is the ninth of these annual events. Uh, uh, prior events have dealt with uh, subjects like hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking, uh, safe natural gas storage, transition of old power plants to cleaner fuels, and various ballot measures to restrict or eliminate oil and gas operations in three California counties, Monterey, uh, San Luis Obispo and Los Angeles counties. And finally, last year's was a, a, a program uh, featuring opposition to a large wind power project in the state of Illinois. For tonight, tonight's topic, Senate Bill 1137 was passed by the California legislature and signed by the governor in September of 2022. Uh, the bill prohibits the drilling of new wells and performing remedial operations within a health protection zone, which is defined as 3,200 feet from a residence, a school, health facility, business, and things like that. It also contains some new regulations about uh, oil spills and emissions. And um, uh, in California, um, so California oil and gas operators have complained that the legislation was rushed to passage without having consideration of more sensible programs that are supported by science. So they've been asserting that the requirements in their present form would lead to increases in California's already high gas prices and locally produced oil would have to be imported from um, uh, foreign countries that have lax environmental standards, not like our own. Almost a million signatures were gathered on a petition to rescind Bill 1137 and send it back to the legislature to craft a more reasonable rules that make scientific sense. And they also protect, they also protect the public and allow operators to produce oil without undue burdens. This petition is going to be on the November ballot as a Proposition 7, and the public can then weigh in on the issue. Supporting the bill and proposition are several uh, environmental groups and local groups, including residents in the affected areas who claim that leaks and emissions from oil and gas operations harm their health and well-being, and also uh, people living and working adjacent to these oil fields. Such groups include Earth Justice, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, and some recently formed neighborhood citizen groups. Okay, this event is a dramatization in which the event is being sponsored by the League of Women Voters of California. The League of Women Voters was first established in 1920 following the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which recognized the right of women to vote for the first time. The League's a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to expand voter rights, encourage grassroots political activity, and drive policy change. It analyzes all of the state uh, ballot measures and makes recommendations on some of them. Many of the propositions on the ballot this fall are very well publicized. You'll see them on television and other media. This one is pretty obscure, so this presentation is meant to educate the public about it. 
Tonight, you're gonna to hear from all the stakeholders in this debate who will be presenting their views. Students will be playing the roles of these stakeholders and their statements are intended to simulate the discussions that may have been expressed at such a public meeting, but they're not the opinions or positions of students, faculty, or the university. Um, I would like to recognize some persons who have been a great help in putting on this event. My colleague, Professor Karen Pandey, our teaching assistant, Yulia Chen, and the staff of the uh, Energy and Science Engineering Department, especially Antoinette Herman House, who's made numerous arrangements and created all these great graphics that, that you're seeing. And she's also moderated the event tonight. And last but not least of all, the student participants who've done a lot of research in preparing for these roles. Um, a video of the event is going to be available and will be posted on the ESE website later this spring. I'd also like to quickly acknowledge Dr. Nancy Sauer, lecturer at the Jones School of Business at Rice University, who created this town hall event format and participated in our first two town hall meetings. The format will be limited to five minute presentations by the participants, followed by a 15 minute period where they can ask questions of each other, or you can ask them questions, uh, uh, those members of the audience. So let's get started. So our first speaker uh, is going to be State Senator Lena Gonzalez, a Democrat from Long Beach, who was the sponsor and originator of the bill. Uh, her office has sent us a video of her presentation to the legislature when she first introduced the bill. So um, uh, it'll, Senator Gonzalez. Members, I rise today to present SB 1137, which will protect the public health of our frontline communities by mandating a 3,200 foot health and safety buffer zone between new and reworked oil and gas wells and sensitive land uses. Sensitive land uses are hospitals, daycares, schools, universities, nursing home facilities. That's what we're asking here. We know now that 2 million Californians currently live within 3,200 feet of an existing oil well. And over 300,000 people in California people in California are living approximately between 600 feet and 700 feet. This is a public health crisis, my friends. We've been here before. It's a long-standing and glaring example of environmental racism. Research shows that, of course, that people of color, black, brown, indigenous people suffer the greatest consequences of this toxic proximity, as these are the same communities that have oil production in their backyards. At a time when oil companies are making record profits on the backs of so many workers, fueling extreme fires, massive floods, and debilitating heat and drought, our state must take action now. And we know that the California Council on Science and Technology reviewed existing scientific studies and determined that from a public health perspective, the most significant exposures to toxic air contaminants occur within one half mile of a well and recommended that the state of California develop science-backed, not politically motivated, backed setback requirements for wells to limit exposures. While CalGEM's own public health researchers have determined that there is no safe di distance Forum oil and gas wells for humans, 3,200 feet will avoid some of the worst exposure and harm to our Californians. So it's time that we do that now. Now, there are a lot of folks that have been talking about oil production and that somehow this, uh, this SB 1137 will somehow allow more for, foreign oil to come in, and that's just not true. It's an uninformed, unrelated um, argument. We're not gonna do that. This is one tenth is, tr is the trajectory of the impact that would it would have on California 
domestic oil. And we've talked to our friends in the trades as well. There are about 10,000 jobs statewide that would uh, be impacted here. But we also know too that we need to get something done. This has been two years in the making in a regulatory process from CalGen. There've been num numerous community meetings and people that have really pleaded with so many of us to ensure that we get this done. And so that I'm asking you to vote aye on AB, I'm sorry, SB 1137. In addition, this passed the assembly floor with 46 votes, 46 votes. It's something that we can do, and I know we can do in terms of the larger climate discussions, but it's something that we must do for our community members, wherever you live, wherever you represent in the state of California. So with that, I, I ask for your eye vote. Okay, our next speaker following the Senator Gonzalez's presentation of, of the issue is Ala Ahmed, and she's a deputy uh, she's a deputy state oil and gas supervisor for the California Geologic Energy Management Division, CalGEM. Uh, they are the regulatory agency in the state of California that uh, regulates the operations of oil and gas uh, uh, operations in the state. So. Deputy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alal Ahmed. I serve as the Deputy State Oil and Gas Supervisor at the California Geologic Energy Management Division, more commonly known as CalGen. In my role, I'm responsible for overseeing the regulation the regulation and enforcement of policies that govern oil, gas, and geothermal energy operations across California, ensuring these activities align with our state safety, environmental, and sustainability goals. We are a key agency under the State Department of Conservation, tasked with critical responsibility of regulating the oil, gas, and geothermal energy operations across California. Our mission is pivotal in ensuring the safe and environmentally responsible management of the state's energy resources. CalGEM oversees an expansive portfolio of over 242,000 wells. This vast number underscores the breadth of our regulatory responsibilities and highlights the importance of our robust workforce. The division employs a multidisciplinary strategy that melds science, engineering, and stringent regulatory frameworks to efficiently regulate the drilling, operation, and the closure of energy resource wells. Despite the lack of specific staffing figures, Cal Jim's active pursuit of technical and supervisory personnel highlights its dedication to assembling a skilled team capable of upholding the state's strict energy regulations. Cal Jim also organizes its operations through state offices for overarching policy and strategy, district offices for localized oversight and engineers within those district offices who directly engage with oil operators. This structure ensures effective enforcement of regulations and facilitates close monitoring of the industry aligning with California's energy and environmental goals. With the introduction of Senate Bill 1137, CalGEM faces new challenges and responsibilities particularly with the establishment of health protection zones. We have proactively prepared for these changes by reallocating resources, enhancing staff training, and recruiting additional experts. Our strategy for implementing SB 1137 is comprehensive, including advanced technology for leak detection, response planning, and rigorous compliance monitoring. Our priority remains the health and safety of Californian communities. Moving 
to strategy for success. Our strategy involves a multifaceted approach to resource allocation, staff education, and enforcement planning. We are confident that with these measures in place, we can lessen the environmental footprint of oil and gas operation while meeting the state energy demand. Calgium is fully committed to the successful implementation of SP 1137 and to undertaking whatever measures are necessary to protect public health and the environment. In conclusion, Calgium stands ready to navigate the challenges ahead. We are committed to our mission of ensuring the safe and environmentally responsible development of California's oil, gas, and geothermal resources. Our strategic approach to regulation combined with our dedication to public health and safety positions us to successfully fulfill our responsibilities. Together, we are committed to a safer and healthier future for all Californians. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question you may have later in the discussion. Thank you, Alia. Yeah. So our next speaker is going to be Pete Sly. Um, Pete is the Deputy Advisor to Governor Newsom um, for natural resources, and he'll be speaking about the government's role uh, in the passage of Senate Bill 1137. Pete? Uh, good evening, everyone. As Professor Court said, I'm going to be speaking for the governor tonight. And while I'm the Deputy Advisor for Natural Resources, I am going to be speaking about some other talking points that the governor would like passed. Next slide, please. I think it's important to, to mention that this bill is just really one of many for my for the governor's California climate commitment. And what that is, is really the world's leading most aggressive climate measures in history. And so in total, as of the fall of 2022, Governor Newsom has signed into law 40 bills. That's 19 assembly bills and 21 Senate bills, uh, totaling $54 billion toward this commitment. And really that is to clean the air we breathe, to hold big pollution accountable, and to usher in a new era for clean energy. And to quote Governor Newsom, later is too late on climate change. And so you can you can see the exact objectives there under the, uh, the goals bullet, but really what we're doing is accelerating our transition to clean energy by 2045. And as part of that, we're getting to 90% by 2035. So we have to be quite aggressive on that. And, um, Again, as I said, we're, we're cutting pollution, we're encouraging nature-based solutions for carbon removal, and we're looking out for, for Californians' health. Next slide, please. And so what the governor wanted me to cover with, cover with you is what Senate Bill 1137 is and what it's not. And to be clear, what it is is following the science, as the governor says, to enact policy. Again, we put we put together the scientific advisory panel, which came up with the fact that uh, these oil drilling operations close to these communities is harmful to their health. And so what we are doing is protecting the health for 2.7 million Californians. And we're also changing outdated rules for CalGEM. Uh, we're familiar with the governor's shakeup of CalGEM a couple, couple years ago, where some notable high up executives were investing in oil companies the ones they were supposed to be overseeing. So we've reoriented them toward their mission, which is to be looking out for the safety and sustainab sustainable um, harvesting of natural resources. And again, what it is as well is it is a means to phase out oil of California. And we're holding big polluters accountable, as I said. And again, it is passed legally by elected representatives countering what it's not, which is giving you no voice. You've elected representatives to be in the um, assembly and the Senate, and they passed this, this bill legally and the governor signed it into law. Another thing that it's not is not an illegal taking. The governor is looking out for the health of 2.7 million Californians. And it is not carelessly eliminating tens of thousands of jobs. 
as uh, Senator Gonzalez said, the report did come back that it would cost 10,000 jobs. But what it is doing is creating even more than that in the clean energy sector in the next two decades. And finally, what it what it's not, it's not an intent to drive gas prices higher, hurt our allies, permanently outsource oil needs, or hurt real estate values. Again, our domestic oil production only accounts for 10% of the oil California uses. So it's not getting at any of those. And finally, if you go to the next slide, please, what the governor wanted me to pass along to you is, one, please vote in November, and two, vote to keep the law. This is for Californians' collective good. I'll take any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, Pete. That was well put. Um, our next speaker will be Barkley Jones, who's president of the San Joaquin Oil Company headquartered in Bakersfield. Hey, everyone. My name is Barkley Jones, and I'll be, I'm the president of the San Joaquin Oil Company. I'm excited to talk to you all today about SB 1137 uh, and how I don't think it's in uh, the best interest for Californians, Americans, and the world. And I'm especially uh, excited that I get to follow uh, the governor's office because I think uh, they've been pretty misleading the public about the implications of the bill they just signed into law. And so I'm very glad that I get a chance to refute some of those points here with y'all today. So the first point I'm going to address is uh, the disparate impact on Californians that SB 1137 is going to have. So uh, currently right now, uh, electric vehicles are um, over $10,000 more expensive on average than your typical uh, internal combustion even engine. The average Californian makes seventy-eight thousand dollars a year. Uh, so the uh, you know lower half of Californians are uh, you know not able to uh, make an excessive ten thousand uh, dollar extra purchase when they're looking at um, buying a vehicle. So the people who need oil and gas most in our community um, is the poorest and least fortunate among us. So this law will obviously uh, reduce the amount of oil being produced and then as money markets work, it's gonna increase the price uh, and it will disparately impact uh, the poorest Californians. Um, additionally, uh, Bakersfield, California, in current county or over 75% of the oil production uh, has an average income of around $58,000. So almost uh, you know, a third of the uh, average income of the state. So the jobs that will uh, be hurt and the people that will be hurt most by uh, this bill are also the poorest Californians. Um, next topic I wanna adjust is the, or address is the inclusive science around uh, the bill. Uh, the 3200 foot band is arbitrary and capricious and not uh, based in relevant science. The uh, studies that were used um, to support the bill uh, were mostly focused on uh, piecemeal reports from uh, different states, while uh, environmental studies in Kern County in Los Angeles showed that uh, there were no significant risk posed to uh, the communities uh, surrounding the oil and gas industry. And why I think it's so important to uh, refer to the Californian uh, studies versus studies from the state is that the oil and gas companies operating inside of California are held to a higher environmental standard than those in other states. And so it's not relevant or pertinent to the, uh, the risks of oil and gas inside California when you look at the way that uh, oil and gas companies might be functioning in Texas or Arkansas, Louisiana. Um, so going forward, you need site-specific studies in, in California in order to understand the implications of oil and gas development in the fields. Uh, next slide, please. Ineffective climate policy. So uh, the governor's office has spoken a lot about how uh, this is uh, an important uh, leg to the stool, right, of California's net zero and climate policies. But ultimately, uh, 
is not going to affect oil consumption uh, inside the state of California. The reality is, like we just talked about before, Californians can't afford electric vehicles and they're going to consume their own gas. And what that means is that oil is going to be brought uh, from around the world to California. In fact, actually 1% of the world's oil is actually So it's not um, a sort of negligible uh, part of the global oil market like the governor's office just suggested. In fact, uh, what we're going to uh, do here with SB 1137 is we're going to create massive climate externalities from the transportation of oil and gas into the state of California. Uh, and additionally, the oil and gas that's going to be being extracted in other places are going to be held to much lower environmental standards than the ones inside California. So you've got the, the cost of transportation um, and then also the cost of extraction, which make this uh, a climate loser, in my opinion. Um, next slide, please. Fiscal liability, this is the biggest one. Um, so uh, right now, right, uh, California has a $68 billion budget deficit. So the state was, <laughs> the state budget's a disaster in the government's office. Uh, instead of trying to increase economic activity and to increase uh, state revenues so we don't default on our debt, it is trying to stomp out local and state businesses that are reliable and good taxpayers and contributors to our um, economy. So my company right now produces $500 million in annual revenue. Um, and so if the SB 1137 bill passes, not only will we not be able to, you know, drill any new wells, we will also have to shut down our existing ones, right? And so what that's going to do is going to take that $500 million, which would be being taxed to zero. And then it also exposes California to a massive uh, liability for taking, um, and you can look at the case law in the California Supreme Court uh, for uh, Hermosa Beach in Monterey County when uh, restrictions were placed on permitted and existing oil and gas operations. Uh, the state court found that that did constitute a taking. And so the court law, uh, or the, sorry, excuse me, the case law supports the uh, position of the oil and gas companies, unlike what the government's office just in fact, uh, you know, a $500 million revenue business getting taken to zero, the, the taking implication of that, I think is safe to say, will be over a billion dollar penalty for the state of California. So um, massive, massive uh, fiscal liability for the state uh, and, you know, bad for your average Californian, bad for your lower income Californian, actually worse for the climate. Um, the SB 1137 is, um, the bill is a loser. And the reality is, is that it was passed by grandstanding politicians that were using it as a political, uh, political tool really, uh, to deflect from the fact that California has had some, some management issues, uh, as you can see from the $68 billion budget deficit. Um, and so what I think uh, the referendum does is it allows uh, our, the, the people, right, and the constituents to decide whether or not this is actually a good idea um, and to learn all the facts about the situation. And I think uh, you know, after the referendum will be, will be validated and it will be reflected that the, the will of your average California is not what's happening in Sacramento right now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Okay, our next speaker will be Sadia Pujol, who's president of an oil and gas company in the Los Angeles area, the Los Angeles Oil Company. So, um, Claudia, we'll, like, we'll hear from you. Thank you very much uh, from the, for the introduction, Warren. So, yeah, I'm Claudia. I'm CEO and president of Camus Resources, an, L, an LA oil company. And I'm here today to argue uh, that SB 1137 uh, is not a good thing for California. I fully support everything that Berkeley said and would like to add a bit more perspective. Uh, next slide. So first of all, kind of, I just wanna put the oil and gas industry in the appropriate context. I feel when sometimes we speak about oil and gas, we're really focused on emissions and on like how, and on the health impact, but this is part of a much bigger picture. Camus Resources have been, has been operating in LA since 1994 
We have 260 employees, 42% of whom are, are racial minorities. This is a really important thing for us, uplift uh, the communities that are around us and create uh, well, good paying and um, stable jobs. We pay 75 million in property taxes to the community, similar, similar to Barclays figure I mentioned earlier. We have 400 active wells, and we would really want to highlight this, operating under the strictest environmental and health regulation in the world. In our last five years, we have had zero failed health or environmental external audits. And this just comes to show the high standard that we operate under. 70% of our wells are equipped with the latest emissions reducing technologies, um, which is you know, in line with the uh, California state average. And we also wanna highlight that we are part of the community. We reinvest about $5 million every year directly into the community. This comes through internship programs for the youth in these favorite schools, reskilling programs, as well as you know sponsorship of the local baseball team. Um, their stadium was falling apart and kind of they are staying alive thanks in part to our funding. We see ourselves as part of a community and we see ourselves in this bigger picture of providing secure energy to California. We're just one of many companies facing these challenges, but I think it's important to ground ourselves in the reality of, of, of what day a day in the oil and gas uh, industry looks like. So, and to Workley's point earlier as well, I think like we need to highlight the, the implications of this. And I feel like, you know, a lot of the discussions that are happening in the Senate and the Congress say, oh, this will not have an impact. This is only 10%. This, this is not how the industry works. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple of key things. I'll skirt over some of the things that Barclay already mentioned. The first thing is there's no scientific backing for closing uh, wells in the LA area specifically. So a lot of the studies that were used by uh, CalGEM were actually based on oil and gas wells that not only operate under different regulations, but also operate in different geologies and with different extraction methods. So a lot of the of the conclusions are simply not extrapolable and uh, are not appropriate for California. So if we look at actually California-based studies, the most actually LA-based studies, the most relevant one we find is the Inglewood study where there was seen a, for a well operating under the same regulation as our wells do. There was no impact on the health um, of residents nearby, uh, and many of them are close to the field. They live within roughly a 1,500 feet of the field, and there was no significant impact on their health or on environment um, at that distance. And so we believe that, the, as mentioned earlier, the 3,200 feet um, distance is extremely arbitrary, and there is no scientific backing concluding that this is a safety um, area for California specifically. Uh, I also want to highlight that a lot of the jobs uh, and taxes will migrate to other states. And while this is, you know, a part of things coming and going, it does feel inappropriate for our own politicians to be imposing this on Californians at a time where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of state deficit and not, not only that, but, you know, Californians themselves, like there's a lot of in economic insecurity. These are the most of vulnerable populations that are affected. We just don't think this is a sensible thing to do. Um, and finally, like I would just like to quickly reiterate that what has been said, if you just eliminate 10% of your oil in your market, this this does not mean that, you know, we can, you can very easily just plug this in with importing oil from either another state or a friendly country, you know, oil trades in international markets, trying to input 10% more can bring costs over the roof. And we just don't want to say, oh, it's just 10% that just, you know, we'll have a 10% increase. We do not know how this will evolve. And it will probably, you cannot just remove 10% of oil in California and expect there to be no consequences. But do you expect 10% of Californians not to drive to work tomorrow? Or, you know, do you want to buy 10% more internationally? We don't know how this will play out, but it's it's not as simple as many politicians want to make it seem. Um, I kind of like just want to wrap up by saying that we do believe in strong regulations. It's not like we think that the oil and gas industry should operate without any environmental regulations. As we saw earlier, we still have up the improvements that we can do with 30% of our wells. There are 
technology that is evolving. We support policies that upgrade facilities and, and improve the reliability, safety, and efficiency. So we're not against that. And we're also not against the energy transition more broadly. Something, an argument that we've heard before is, oh, by closing these wells, we accelerate the energy transition. And I want to state for fact, that's not true. You can have both an energy transition that creates jobs and brings millions in taxes to California, and you can have an efficient, reliable, and safe oil extraction in California for Californians. We believe that putting one against the other is an extremely political motivation with no scientific backing. We think that both are possible. We want them both to be possible. And this is why we encourage all citizens to vote against SB 1137 in November. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pujol. You're a strong advocate for your industry. Okay. Our next speaker that we'll hear, hear from is Ashwini Takari, and um, she's the Vice President for Public Affairs of the California Independent Petroleum Association. Okay, Thank you so much, see. Professor Court, for introduction. Um, I am representing the stand of SIPA as a Vice President, and we are opposing this bill. SB 1137, SEPA has always championed the interest of state's oil and natural gas sector and represented hundreds of oil and natural gas sector stakeholders. A broad membership accounts for the lion's share of California's energy production, and it stands united in opposition to SB 1137 on following grounds. Uh, my next slide. There are some of the detailed arguments which I would like to present against SB 1137. First of all, it provides inequitable treatment of the domestic energy sector. The bill imposes the harsh regulations on the local operation, which uh, the competitors such as international entities do not have to face. This not only undercut California's producer, but also implicitly endorses less regulated foreign practices. It, is esta it establishes market discrimination and it distorts the market dynamics by skewing the market and potentially leading to a monopolistic scenario where only foreign oil thrives and it could inflate the prices and reduce market resilience against the global supply shock. Uh, next slide. Uh, it also creates the economic setback for California because the increase in energy cost is likely to have a multiplier effect. It can have a cascading effect throughout the economy and disproportionately affecting especially the lower income household. Energy prices are uh, there in living cost, and therefore this bill has an impact of increasing the cost of living, affecting every Californian. Uh, essentially, it is it has high inflationary tendencies. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, this is a map which we have taken from the state's own view, which does not justify the 3,200 foot setback. If we see the entire LA basin has been put into disuse because of this health protection zone uh, and putting lots and lots of jobs in peril and lots and lots of oil, gas, natural uh, natural gas uh, industry in disuse. Uh, next slide. Uh, I have taken this map from Balvin Field Oil Field uh, Health Risk Assessment for Cancer. If we look at it very carefully, we can see that there is no scientific data or scientific basis for the 3,200 feet distance, which has to be maintained between oil and gas industry and the protected zone. We can see that there the, the concentration of the acute chronic crisis is way far and we cannot really say that 3,200 feet is going to save or kind of change the scenario. Next slide. The acute risk controlling also shows that the 3,200 feet is not realistic assessment for the health health risk uh, uh, health risk related issues, which has which has really been the basis of this bill. That 3,200 feet distance is going to save or change a lot of tendencies, but actually it is not. Next slide. This bill has a detrimental effect of employment as has been put forth by the uh, by Claudia and Barkley. And I fully agree with them. The oil and natural gas sector is a pivotal in providing state employment to many people and they are all going to lose their job because of this bill. These restrictive policies are going to impact the domestic job market, increasing unemployment. And it will also lead to the unemployment in allied industries who actually depend on energy market. Next. U.S. is committed to net zero goal, but it is also committed to just and fair energy transition. 
This bill compromises on climate goals by shifting the global emission to the oil and natural gas producing countries. The energy transition does not mean that a country should appropriate all the resources for itself by pushing the carbon emission to the other countries. And therefore, this bill is actually putting the environmental objectives at risk. This is an era where we have like fossil fuel, nuclear, as well as renewable energy integration going on in the grid. In such circumstances, putting ban, prohibition, or restriction on the domestic industry is highly detrimental to just and fair energy transition. And it also raises the question on U.S.'s leadership as a as a uh, U.S.'s leadership towards the just and fair energy transition claims. Next, thank you. Legisl there are there are many legislative flaws while framing this bill and uh, many other factors, especially contextual factors should have been taken into consideration. This bill is based on the unproven health hazard claims that there is an acute risk of cancer due to many more ingredients which are being used in oil and natural gas industry. However, it has never been established on the basis of evidence that this phenomenon of ca acute cancer risk uh, has been caused due to the industry and therefore there is a lot of data misuse. The environment of questionable data is uh, also not only undermines the industry, but it also misinforms the public who is, uh, who is uh, counted on to vote for this bill. And therefore we request everyone to vote against this bill. Next slide. I would like to, uh, can you please, thank you. Can you please, uh, thank you. The Beverly Hill High School case is one of the glaring example where the uh, where the case twelve suits have been filed against the Beverly Hill High School for their oil operation. However, they have been summarily dismissed by the court for lack of evidence because there was no scientific and medical evidence by epidemiologists that the uh, cancerous or the potential cancers have been caused by the oil and natural gas operations on the Beverly Hill High School. It actually highlights the danger of policy making, which has not been based on substantiated claim. Another case is Chevron USA versus County of Monterey. There are uh, organizations like CalGEM, which are uh, empowered and interested with the job of making regulations, especially how an oil and natural gas industry should operate in such circumstances, a bill appropriating that power from the regulatory mechanism and creating a, creating a bill or creating uh, some sort of restriction on the, on the industry is highly unconstitutional. Such effort has been done in County of Monterey and court has actually upheld the challenge by oil and gas uh, industry to these regulations. In conclusion, SIPA's resistance to SB 1137 is, it is not due to its aversion to the regulation, but it is a call for balanced and scientifically, scientifically grounded policy making, which, uh, on the which will be the basis for a uh, thriving energy market, employment, and well-being of the Californians. We want legislative framework which should support the sustainable development, economic stability, along with environmental responsibility. Therefore, we request on behalf of the organization that uh, this bill should be opposed and people should vote against it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ashwari, for that good presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Our next speaker is going to be Yi Yun Lim, who's president of the California chapter of the National Royalty Owners Association. Um. Thank you. Um, I'm Ijin, the president of the California chapter of the National Royalties Owners Association. Um, our mission is to support, advocate, and ed educate for the empowerment of mineral and royalty owners. And we are responsible for creating a space where we can assist mineral and royalty owners in creating fair negotiations and obtaining accurate information so that they can make the best decisions possible. So um, next slide, please. Um, as the president of the California chapter of the National Royalty Owners Associ Association, we are concerned about SB 1137 because, firstly, the bill was made in a rush without any real input or debate from people living in the community. Many of our royalty owners live in the communities where these oil and gas wells are being drilled and are 
are amenable to it. They are also benefiting from these activities as it allows them to earn a steady stream of income. SB 1137 has neglected the voices of royalty owners who support the gas and oil exploration activities taking place in their own communities and silent their voices. Enacting SB 1137 will also eliminate much needed income of many tens of thousands of Californians. In the most direct manner, the victims of SB 1137 are not big oil companies that possess great financial reserves to tide through the bills aftermath, but ordinary Californians who rely on the royalty accrued from these oil and gas explorations as a steady stream of income to finance their daily expenses. These negative cons consequences have clearly been felt by our members. Recently, we have launched a Stop the Energy Shutdown campaign, where we tried to stop the implementation of the bill through the support of the general public. Um, it was headed by the California Independent Petroleum Association and supported by us. And we managed to gather over 950,000 voter signatures to place a referendum on this ballot so that Californian voters could have a say in deciding on this matter through the November 2024 general election. As previously mentioned, the state's acquiring of these oil and gas wells is equivalent to the taking of private property, and many of these, and we may have the legal right to compensation. So, Californian taxpayers might be indirectly responsible for paying for this compensation, which is why they should have the right to decide whether to support the bill or not. And currently, California has the nation's strictest oil and gas laws and hence produces the country's greenest oil. The oil and gas industry only produces 12% of the state's methane emissions. And the main culprit is the large dairy production farm industry in California. Increasing the prices of oil and gas exploration activities here would only increase California's reliance on foreign oil, which is even less green, while causing our electricity prices to rise steeply. Implementing the bill might end up being a misguided attempt at greenwashing, where the state relinquishes the moral responsibility of producing green oil and shifting that burden to other countries with laxer restrictions. In this process, this also ends up harming Californians by lowering their incomes and causing their electricity prices to rise. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lim. Our next speaker will be Campbell Jenkins, who's chairman of the California State Building and Construction Trades Council. Campbell? Thanks, Warren, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Campbell. I'm the chairman of the California State Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of our nearly half a million strong diverse membership, including those employed directly in the oil and gas extraction business. Uh, our work focuses on advocating for prevailing wages for members, building robust training pathways through apprenticeship programs, and fighting for safe working conditions and job security for our members. An overwhelming majority of our membership hails from underprivileged communities throughout California, many of the same communities that this legislation seeks to protect. Our advocacy efforts today are centered around preserving a vital and stable pathway to the middle class in a state where these opportunities are dwindling. Uh, next slide, please. To begin, I'd like to ground our discussion in the impact that SB 1137 will likely have on CSB CTC members. Crucially, under SB 1137, the legislation mandates that existing wells are largely ineligible to receive permits for modification or repairs. Indeed, the nonpartisan Legislative Analyst Office finds that because wells often need modification or repairs to remain functional, the law would effectively phase out operations at many of these existing wells within a few years. The result, according to the California Chamber of Commerce, is impact to 15,338 wells, as well as downstream impacts to refineries. The fallout from the widespread closure of wells is widespread. The California Chamber of Commerce quantifies for us, finding that the, le the legislation places roughly 8,000 jobs in oil, gas, construction, trade, and supplying industries at risk. These jobs are not easily replaceable. They represent a dwindling number of high-paying unionized jobs that compensate workers at more than double the median state individual income level. 
Uh, next slide, please. With this impact in mind, the loss of roughly 8,000 high paying unionized jobs, our primary objection to SB 1137 is that it does not ensure a just transition for fossil fuel workers in California. The CSB, the, excuse me, the CBS CTC understands that California is moving towards a low carbon future. And we want the best for California communities because they're the same communities that our members and their families live and work in. However, we do not think that SB 1137 goes nearly far enough in ensuring a just transition for the many fossil fuel workers in these communities. SB 1137, as written, does not include any provisions to, ad to address job losses. Shockingly, the word worker is not mentioned once in the bill, despite putting more than 8,000 high paying unionized jobs at risk. In this way, SB 1137 represents a significant departure from federal legislation and other California legislation that recognizes the injustice of eliminating high paying unionized jobs by a stroke of the legislative pen and includes provisions meant to help fossil fuel workers transition into cleaner jobs. SB 1137 does not do that. It is hard to overstate the impact of eliminating these jobs without any transitional assistance will have on workers and their families. While hard to quantify precisely, we can look to the UC Berkeley Labor Center survey of the nearly 350 unionized workers affected by the 2020 Contra Costa Marathon refinery closure for an indication of what is to come for these 8,000 workers. Put simply, the center finds that post layoff jobs did not compare in pay or working conditions to marathon refinery jobs. Getting a job meant getting a worse job. In the two years following the closure, one of every four laid off workers remained unemployed. Of those who found employment, the overwhelming majority took a pay cut in the range of $12 per hour. Many found work in oil and gas, opportunities that would be harder to come by as a result of this legislation. More than half of previously unionized workers now work in non-union positions. This means that ex-marathon workers are contending with nearly universal lower pay and worse working conditions, including, including hazardous job sites, heavier workloads, poor safety practices, and fewer opportunities for advancements. Every day for these workers now includes increased financial, emotional, and employment insecurity post layoff, including, in the workers' words, an inability to pay mortgages, selling their cars, pulling kids from extracurricular activities, severe de depression, and increased job switching. Workers repeatedly described the magnitude of what the layoff meant in their lives. They were losing a job that they, that they had thought they would hold until retirement. They were essentially being laid off from their lives. This by itself, next slide please, represents an incredibly steep price to pay. But what exactly are we paying for? California maintains some of the most stringent environmental health and safety regulations of any major oil producing region in the world. The oil that California produces and consumes is some of the most responsibly produced ever anywhere. SB 1137 does not reduce California dependence on oil. The EIA notes that as a large consumer, California is expected to continue to rely on oil and gas and their derivative products for some time. This means that rather than consuming oil and gas pr produced responsibly in California, the state will need to import more, more oil and gas from regions with lower environmental health and safety standards. This policy is the equivalent of sweeping the problem under the rug, exporting the impact of oil and gas production without reducing consumption to places less equipped to responsibly produce oil and gas. And we've covered this a bit before, so I'll sort of gloss through it. Uh, the state faces tremendous loss and liability exposure on the order of $4 billion reduction in state revenue statewide and $97.6 billion in losses from the taking clause from a study done by Los Angeles County. Many of these losses would affect the communities the legislation is meant to protect most significantly. And last slide, please. The CSBCTC supports a setback bill, support for a setback bill is predicated on significant revisions most crucially, provisions recognizing the impact that the legislation would have on workers and adding transitional support for laid off workers, some of the measures seen here on the slide. The CSBTC appreciates that the state is in a time of transition and the effort to protect our members' communities. 
Our members come from a long lineage of CSBCTC workers who have quite literally built the California that we all know and love. In times of need, earthquakes, fires, and flood, Californians count on CSBCTC workers to help rebuild. Legislation that strips 8,000 of these same workers of their livelihood, without having the decency to mention the word worker once, demands serious revisions before passage. For these reasons, the CSBCTC and its nearly 500,000 members cannot support SB 1137 in its current form. And I welcome any questions. Thanks for the time. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins, for that excellent presentation. Our next speaker will be Alex Wang, who is the, the Deputy for Energy and Employment uh, uh, for the Kern County Board of Supervisors. Alex? Hello, I'm Alex Wang. I'm the Deputy for Energy and Employment as part of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. I'm here today to present my statement in support of the referendum to overturn Senate Bill 1137. Oil and natural gas is a core industry of Kern County. The county alone generates 71% of California's oil production and 78% of the state's natural gas production as of 2019. As my colleague Ryan Alsop has publicly observed, nowhere else in California is as tied to oil and gas the way that we are, and we cannot replace what that brings overnight. It is undeniable that the Senate bill will impact our county, both directly and indirectly, and have long-term ramifications for the well-being of our community. I believe the real issue at hand is conducting a fair energy transition. As an example, our county is also the largest supplier of California's wind and solar power. But the revenue we receive from our renewables is only 1% of the tax revenue we receive from our fossil fuels. In short, we are simply not able to care for our community financially with renewables alone at this time, which this bill would force us to do. And so it will create direct and indirect impacts. Digging into the direct effects. The direct effects of this Senate bill would be the loss of an industry that generates not only high levels of economic activity, for both Kern County and California State, but also one that creates and sustains jobs, attractive wages, and in turn, economic mobility and opportunity for our residents. Oil and gas supports tens of thousands of jobs, as well as the highest wages in our county, triple that of the average in 2020 for, our, for Kern. More importantly, the types of jobs that this sector offers span the range of types of workers, including technically skilled versus not, and college educated versus not. Finally, the bill would also threaten the livelihood of businesses that are technically outside of the oil and gas industry, but offer key services to the industry or are otherwise dependent. This could create an outsized financial impact if Senate Bill 1137 were to pass, then just the job losses and loss of tax revenue directly created by the oil and gas industry. Next, the indirect effects. Revenue streams from oil and natural gas are a key contributor to the integrity and stability of our county's tax base. In 2017, the oil and gas sector alone contributed $925 million to both state and local tax revenues. Even more specifically, from 2018 to 2019, this industry contributed $197 million of local tax revenue to Kern County that supports public services and social infrastructure all critical to serving the well-being of our people in our community. Moreover, Kern County is facing increasing challenges like the growing cost of living and homelessness that will need the support and stability of tax revenues. This Senate bill could create and compound broader economic hardship for our community well beyond just the environmental impacts of the oil and gas industry. Finally, this bill poses a long-term economic threat to our growth and development. This bill's stringent regulations could deter investment in Kern County's energy sector, stifling economic growth and innovation. Businesses may be hesitant to commit capital to projects or expansions in an environment of regulatory uncertainty and heightened compliance costs that this bill would create. Next, Long-term consequences could include stifled job creation, damping the ability of our county to retain residents, or attract new people who can bring in new businesses and talent. Third, 
California is an energy island, vulnerable to energy shortages and price spikes. Dependence on foreign oil increases this vulnerability, a weakness that would be entangled with the passage of this Senate bill. Far from allowing our citizens to truly divest from fossil fuel, Senate Bill 1137 would make our community's economic welfare even more closely tied to the decisions of foreign oil. Finally, from an environmental perspective, this bill can also create a double down effect by further limiting Kern County's ability to diversify away over time from oil and natural gas by using clarity to attract different types of people, businesses, and investments. In conclusion, the stricter environmental regulations proposed by this bill will hurt the people of Kern County today, both directly and indirectly, and in the future. The real issue and real goal at hand is building a path for sustainable energy transition for Kern County. And ultimately, Senate Bill 1137 is not the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for the presentation. Our next speaker is Nishant Tuare, who's a professor in the Department of Economics at Stanford University. Professor. Thank you, Warren. Pleasure to be here. So I'm going to look at the issue from economic lens, uh, and we're going to look at the supply and demand part of it. Um, next. Uh, if you look at the energy transition scenario, like 2021 versus what we expect in 2050, we see that renewables gonna increase from 21% to 44% and natural gas dips from 37 to 34%, that's not a major dip. And other parts like uh, the reduction actually in fossil fuels from, from coal retirement and uh, nuclear retirement, that's gonna happen. Uh, there is a interesting piece around energy storage that I'm gonna deal in like Next slide. And within renewables, uh, I mean, as I said, uh, it's more largely driven by wind and solar. There is interesting dynamic that the dominance of solar over wind is going to happen. At present, the wind is dominating the scene. Like within renewables, it's 43%, but solar is going to be 51% by 2050. All said and done, there is this story I'm telling because I want to set a context around like what US energy system is going to look like and how you think the energy transition is going to happen and how the energy mix is going to change. Uh, next. And now we come to the issue of oil. Where does oil fit in this energy transition? How the demand and supply are going to evolve over time? So California consumed nearly 528 million barrels of oil in 2022. And this means 1% increase over 2021 levels. We consume daily about 1.45 million barrels. And what the bill tries to do is not cutting the demand. They're just cutting the supply, the local supply, and we're saying we're going to curb production. And the real question is, don't use oil or make policy in such a way that, that our demand declines. But policies, in, in effect, what, have, what they have done is there is 25% decline in local oil production and loss of 90 million barrels in the last four years. And as other speakers have already pointed out, there is increased dependence on foreign oil. 59% of our oil is made by foreign imports and only around 26% is made by in-state production. And there is a piece around Alaska and within US that rest of the demand is being fulfilled. Next. Uh, if you think of policy, uh, it's not effective because it's not reducing the demand, it's just cutting the supply and making California vulnerable for foreign, I would say, uh, anything that relates to geopolitical stability, be it Ukraine or Middle East, and you have price swings because of our reliance on international oil markets. That adds to economic strain on Californians families, small businesses, daily commuters. These are the people that's going to impact it. And as everybody pointed out before me, I fully agree to that. 
our oil production meets world's cleanest and strictest standards. So are we just saying that we are doing the energy transition or are we exporting emissions outside California? So if you think as it's a global common problem and it re requires a global common response. So by those standards, we are just importing emissions out. And I think there is also a call for local energy independence. And I heard about industry representation. I fully agree there that there has to be a strategic use of local resources. And there is economic and environmental benefits, even if we continue with oil production here. And uh, yeah, next one. Uh, I now come to the interesting piece around storage. The success of renewables in providing grid stability and resilience depends upon how easily and how quickly we build storage. And as you see, we, we are growing fast and we are on a path that the government decided, but still we are far from uh, where we start shifting the demand away from fossil fuel or demand, oil demand is going to go low. So the fossil fuel dependence will be there. So the storage story is again a big piece here, which I think if we at all need to shift like our energy mix from oil to or like other uses to you know renewables, we need to build storage faster than what we have envisaged for. Next. However, I think looking at the other part of the argument saying that what Bill can introduce is job creation is in other sectors because once incentive incentives are not there, could there be a better build around different technologies or like alternatives? And there could be investment in innovation. There could be economic diversification and maybe it, it's a it's an issue in the short term, but finally people will realize that we need to shift and there'll be like big oil companies will do capex investment somewhere else to make uh, energy transition more more a reality and it can accelerate energy transition that's one part of the argument that i've been hearing uh, that's in literature and people pro bill they argue like that next but really it's uh, i would say it is 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 full of challenges the path is uh, because it depends up, upon innovation and energy solutions and though it could be catalyst for funding and research and finding alternatives, uh, energy storage and a smart grid integration and finding alternate solutions, which decrease the demand of oil, that should be the main aim. And it, it's, it faces economic hurdles, infrastructure development is required, and this policy is a failure to begin with uh, for all the reasons I stated, uh, mostly centered around it's just the export of emission rather than anything else. So uh, I, I would say that I agree to most of the points made by industry and other representatives and the demand and supply uh, from, from economic lens doesn't look encouraging. And I lean like I lean towards not implementing SP 37. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, our next speaker is Ian Foucher who's a senior attorney with the Earth Justice Program, the, their Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. Thanks very much, Warren. I appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Ian Fauché, and I'm playing the role tonight of a senior attorney for Earth Justice and the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment here to speak in support of uh, May I interrupt? Um, yep. I don't Sorry. I think your slides are up to date yet. I need a minute to adjust that. Uh, Oren, could we move to the next speaker first? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry, no Aaron, we'll skip you and come back to you. Okay. Sounds good, thanks. Our next, our next speaker will be Julio Contreras, who's a coalition co coordinator for VISION, which is an acronym for Voices in Solidarity Against Oil and Neighborhoods. Hey, Warren. Hi. There we thank go. Thank you for, for stepping in. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here today to discuss the merits of SB 1137. So uh, 
My name is Julio and I'm the Coalition Coordinator for Vision, which represents a collection of eight organizations dedicated to improving living conditions in California. Um, and we do that through sensible policies that promote environmental justice. Um, so the main reason I'm here today is to voice our collective opinion on SB 1137. Um, I speak for the entire coalition when I say that after reviewing all the available evidence, we view SB 1137 as absolutely paramount to the health of Californians and millions of other Americans facing indirect exposure to harmful contaminants. Um, so what the bill is doing is it's moving to establish health protection zones by prohibiting the issuance of permits to drill new wells or remedial operations within 3,200 feet of sensitive receptors. It also compels operators to develop a leak detection system and adopt standards for emissions detection uh, that would vastly improve our understanding of damage caused by oil and gas facilities and also help improve emissions accounting uh, and also risk calculations for potential investors um, in the energy sector. So it is no surprise that proximity to oil and gas facilities has been associated with illnesses like cancer, um, respiratory issues, and a myriad of other things for decades. And at present, 2.7 million Californians live within 3,200 feet of a drilling facility. Uh, and many of these people are children, uh, as you can see in the photo, and other sensitive populations who were especially affected uh, by the pandemic in underserved communities. Um, so some of these residents are actually here today, um, and we'll have a chance to attest to how these operations are disruptive to their health um, and daily lives. So um, the health impacts of drilling operations are far more reaching than they seem. Um, Drilling operations in California really encroach on fields that grow one third of the nation's produce uh, and feed millions of people, uh, not only in America and in other states, but really around the world. And the potential for soil and water contamination increases each day that these facilities stay open and is a large reason why it's so imperative the bill passes uh, and we improve emission detection systems and really establish a base from which to work with. Um, with so many lives at stake, uh, we believe that it would be irresponsible to not take precautions that could alter countless lives, uh, especially those of the future generation. So uh, today you'll hear critics of this bill tell you that it would displace workers, increase energy prices, and increase our reliance on imported oil. And while we here at Vision recognize that the clean energy transition can cause hardships, we believe the state of California is taking action to address these issues, and um, those are up for discussion. So. Uh, for example, California's climate commitment, which is separate from SB 1137, pledges to invest $315 million to provide training and education for workers to get new jobs in the clean energy industry and to also plug orphan oil wells. So this will help provide work opportunities and retraining for the estimated 50,000 workers that could be affected by this bill. Uh, it will also, at the same time, enlarge our clean energy workforce uh, which would help build out the clean energy projects that will be necessary for us to meet our established climate goals that are so ambitious. So transitioning towards solar, wind, and other renewable energies will reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. It will also mitigate price volatility, promote true energy independence, and serve as a model for other countries to follow as California has done for so long. Um, we here at Vision uh, believe that the greatest wealth is health, and oil prices can be influenced by a complex set of factors uh, beyond only local production changes, as would happen with SB 1137. Uh, an increase in energy prices that could result from SB 1137 regardless uh, could be significantly offset by the reduction in healthcare costs associated with airborne illnesses and exposure to toxic pollutants that um, may be leaking that we might not even have an idea is happening because we don't have leak detection systems in place the way we want to. Um, so by mitigating the adverse health effects linked to these operations, uh, communities uh, in the San Joaquin Valley and in Kern County, like a county that has the most air pollution of any county in the country, could really see a substantial decrease in medical expenses and lost productivity. Um, and for these reasons, we at Vision urge you to vote against the referendum today and uphold the SB 1137. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Contreras. Um, Julia, are we ready to go back to Mr. Fauché? No, maybe we should move to the next one first. Sorry. 
Okay, we'll, we'll have this worked out eventually. Uh, well, we'll skip then to Mary Boyer, who's a resident of the city of Arvin, California. I think, <clears throat> not sure if my slide is, oh, perfect, okay. Um, hi, my name is Mary Boyer and I'm a homeowner in Arvin, California. I'm a mom of two young boys. You might hear them screaming in the background. Um, and I'm concerned about the health and social impacts of repealing the setbacks and monitoring promised by SB 1137. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Arvin is located in what's known as a sacrifice zone, where oil drilling is concentrated in low income communities of color. This means that oil companies are sacrificing the health, quality of life, and property values of people in these zones in the name of corporate profits. Oil and gas wells cause air, visual, and noise pollution and deplete and contaminate our local groundwater and soil. Over 2 million Californians live within 2,500 feet of oil and gas operations, and people of color represent more than 9 out of 10 residents who live near oil and gas wells statewide. 92.5% of Arvin residents identify as Latino, <clears throat> and studies indicate that the proposed setback would reduce the risk of adverse health effects, including asthma, respiratory illnesses, preterm birth, low birth weight, cancer, and premature death, including from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, between 2006 and 2015, more than a million babies were born in California to mothers who live within one kilometer, which is roughly the setback um, of this law of an oil or gas well. And research shows that babies born near oil and gas wells are more likely to experience health threats, including premature birth, heart defects, and low birth weight. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Arvin residents experience some of the worst pollution in the country, and due in part to local oil and gas drilling, Arvin, and Arvin residents are exposed to ozone and particulate matter at concentrations higher than 94 to 98% of the rest of the state. Many of our neighbors suffer from severe asthma, allergies, cancer, nosebleeds, and other illnesses. An example that illustrates the need for the leak detection plans promised by SB 1137 is that in 2014, our community members living near the high school became sick and testing revealed that levels of toxic gas 13 times higher than the EPA's limits originating from a Petro Capital Resources pipeline was the cause for their illness. Um, eight families needed to evacuate their homes for eight months. Um, we are proud of our local grassroots organization, the Committee for a Better Arvin, that pushed for a local ordinance that was passed in 2018 that established a 300-foot setback for oil wells. Arvin underlies the Mountain View oil field, which is a century-old oil field and is um, also one of the few areas in California that's still experiencing new exploration. As a mature oil field, it's also in a state of production decline, and increasingly toxic methods and chemicals are used to extract more oil from working wells. We are concerned that these chemicals will cause even more damage to local communities. And to add insult to injury, our local residents and farmers are required, required to ration their water, while oil producers are allowed to use fresh water in their operations rather than having to recycle their own produced water. Their produced water is dumped into unlined pits, which seep into aquifers and dislodge arsenic sediments, creating unsafe drinking water. Our local water in Arvin is so contaminated that most families rely on expensive bottled water, which the 28% of Arvin residents living below the poverty line cannot comfortably afford. The protections required by SB 1137 are quite literally the least oil producers can do for our community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> here's a picture oh here's a picture of me with one of Arvin's youngest residents my younger son Omid um and so I welcome the members of the California Independent Petroleum Association sponsoring the repeal of this bill to move to Arvin since the setbacks and monitoring required by SB 1137 are so unnecessary I personally invite you to come to Kern County, bring your children, your pregnant selves, your pregnant wives, and your immunocompromised grandparents, and settle down in the heartland of California's oil production. 
Enjoy the fresh air and clean water here. Let your kids play in our clean dirt. Surely this is a safe place for you to raise your families, and this legislation is completely unnecessary. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Boyer. Um, I, gosh, I feel like I live in Arvin after listening to your <laughs> presentation. Um, Julia, are we yeah. ready for Mr. Fauché? Yes. <laughs> Okay. All technical problems get solved by our capable students. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so thanks again. And and my name is Ian Fauché. I'm, I'm a senior attorney for Earth Justice and the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment here to speak in support of SB 1137. Uh, on the next slide, for those of you not familiar, um, Earth Justice is the world's leading public interest environmental law organization. Uh, we advocate across California for a healthy environment and a zero emissions future. And Yulia, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, and then CRPE is a national environmental justice organization rooted in the San Joaquin Valley, which supports low income communities and communities of color in advocating for a healthier natural environment. Um, on the next slide, I just want to first provide some context on the communities impacted by oil and gas drilling. So across the state of California, people of color make up 70% or more of the 2.7 million living close to oil and gas wells, which is disproportionately large compared to the state as a whole. Uh, and across the San Joaquin Valley, especially including San Joaquin County and Kern County, where um, where CRPE is based, Californians are living with some of the worst air quality in the nation, which is exacerbated every day by oil and gas development. And those folks are many of the more than one third of the 2.7 million listed on the uh, screen here who are considered most burdened by environmental pollution in the state um, by, by uh, the California government. So on the next slide, now that we have that context on who's impacted here, I'd like to talk about the health impacts of oil and gas drilling. So many, many studies over decades have found that air pollutants that oil and gas wells produce can reach levels associated with adverse health impacts. And those include pre-production emissions of methane, they include benzene, which is a known carcinogen, toluene, volatile organic compounds, fine particulate matter, silica dust, uh, these are all linked, many of them, to respiratory problems, to neurological problems, to cardiovascular damage, to birth defects, cancer, and premature mortality. And we know from the California Council on Science and Technology that the most significant exposure to toxic air contaminants occur within one half mile of a well. So taking all this together, we know that these facilities emit local air pollutants, that those air pollutants harm human health and that they create disproportionate harm to poorer Californians and to people of color. And we've already heard from Ms. Mr. Contreras that water and soil contamination is possible too, which brings us to an extremely easy decision, which the California legislature already made, which is that it is clear common sense to stop approving wells near schools, houses, and other sensitive locations. If we go on to the next slide, though, uh, the oil and gas industry in California, unfortunately, feels otherwise, and they've spent $20 million on this referendum to overturn this common sense, democratically adopted policy. But even the oil and gas industry knows that what it's doing is undemocratic and unpopular. They are trying to hide it. When oil companies were at, out asking for support from Californians, they pretended that they were on the other side of this fight. Take a look at the right side of the screen, which shows real signs used to convince people to sign a petition opposing SB 1137. They say things like no oil and gas wells, demand health and safety. The oil companies here simply pretend that they are on our side and misled people into signing a petition to qualify this referendum for the ballot. This was not an isolated incident. An article in the Los Angeles Times reported on signature gatherers misleading signers, quote, all over the state. I couldn't say it better than their own signs, protect our children and elders, keep SB 1137. Now, before I finish, I'd like to just address a few of the arguments you've already heard today from oil and gas advocates uh, on the next slide. So first, oil executives argued that this will increase oil imports from foreign countries. Believe me, if the oil and gas industry would like to decrease oil imports into California, Earth Justice and CRPE stand ready and able to support policies which end fossil fuel use in this state. 
I will let you guess how oil companies feel about those policies. They are just trying to muddy the water. Mr. Jones suggested earlier that this will increase gas prices in California, which is an age old scare tactic from these companies. This law will have a minuscule impact on the enormous global oil market. It affects a tiny sliver of the millions and millions of wells worldwide and doesn't even shut down a single well. But nonetheless, our opponents told voters that this would bring California to $10 per gallon gas. And finally, Ms. Lim from the royalty owners suggested that SB 1137 was somehow undemocratic. In fact, it was passed by comfortable margins by democratically elected representatives in the California legislature and signed by the state governor. All in all, this referendum is just an attempt to wrestle a few more years out of profits from pumping oil and gas right next to schools, houses, and nursing homes. It's as easy a decision as it sounds, and I encourage you to oppose the referendum. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Our next speaker will be Hanan Hassan Alamani is a resident of Bakersfield, California. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Hanan, and I have been working in the oil and gas industry for the past decade. I'm here today not to represent the company I work for, but to share my opinion and voice my concerns as a member of this community. So allow me to remind you of a few simple truths that are often, that are often overlooked by those talking negatively about the oil and gas industry. First, I believe it's important to address the key role of the oil industry in the economy and the well-being of citizens. While progress has been made and the renewable energy is coming into the market, we're still faced by an increasing energy demand to power things such as transportation, industrial and residential sectors. And to meet this demand, we need all available energy resources, including oil and gas, and we also need to find ways to produce it locally. So if SB1137 is implemented, it would force many operators out of business, and the energy supply deficit will only be resolved by importing oil from out of state. And we, as a community, will have to pay the price as gas prices will continue to increase. It's also equally important to recognize that the oil industry contributes substantial revenue to the government through taxes, royalties, and lease payments. And these revenues support various public services and infrastructure projects, and they benefit citizens across the state. Secondly, I want to highlight the strong measures oil and gas companies have taken to mitigate, to mitigate uh, the, ne the negative impacts. One thing that not everyone might be aware of is the oil production in California is under the strongest environmental and labor standards in the world. Those extraction operations are regulated by more than two dozen federal, state, and local regulatory agencies, and they enforce standards relating to air, water, and greenhouse gas emissions, just to name a few. Also, these companies are required to have a management plan for each and every well, including a comprehensive well testing regimes to prevent any leaks. We, as employees, we take this responsibility very seriously and we don't hesitate to request plugging wells earlier than planned if we have concerns about the health or the safety because we ourselves will be affected first if there is an issue. So the bottom line is oper um, operations are always conducted with an obligation to, to protect the environment and the health and safety of employees and contractors as well as the communities. Next slide, please. Lastly, I would like to draw attention to the operator's contribution to local communities. The contribution is not limited to volunteering and supporting nonprofits or organizations. Some of these companies actually provide opportunities for high school students to learn about energy and to industrial facilities. And even if you go to offer um, summer internship programs, I believe that education has the power to dramatically strengthen the underprivileged communities and giving the youth such opportunities will help ignite their interest in STEM and empower them to have a bright future. 
all these areas, ladies and gentlemen, deserve more attention from our community leaders and residents alike. And remember that SB 1137 will make 10,000 employees lose their jobs, myself included. And those employees are members of your community. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Valeria Vaca, who's a business owner in Bakersfield. Good evening, everybody. I'm Valeria, the pro business owner of Bakersfield Tech, coming from California. Today, I'm here to express my strong opposition to Senate Bill 1137. As a dedicated member of our business community, I believe it is essential to advocate for policies that foster innovation, growth, and prosperity. SB 1137, in my perspective, poses challenges that may hinder the very essence of what makes Bakersfield Tech and our broader community thrive. Throughout my business, uh, throughout my journey as a business owner, I have experienced the potential and resilience of our local economy. So, uh, the first problem I want to summarize is that the rising costs of energy are casting a shadow over the landscape of small businesses, including my own venture, Bakersfield Tech. The impact of these escalating prices is multifaceted, affecting us in ways that extend beyond the bottom line. Uh, one of the primary concerns is the potential exacerbation of California's already elevated gas prices. Decreasing the states in state energy supplies could in intensify our dependence on costly imported foreign oil. This is not only threatens to inflate our operational expenses, but also, uh, you can go back, please. But, uh, back. yeah, yeah. Uh, but also adds to the environmental burden through increased greenhouse gas emissions. As a business owner, Deeply invested in the local community, I am compelled to express my reservations about the potential consequences of such policies. Furthermore, as you can see, uh, the oil and gas industries play a significant role in our state's workforce, providing direct employment to 45,000 individuals. There are not just numbers, they represent hardworking Californians who contribute to our economy in various capacities, from coal, oil, and gas extraction to office jobs and roles in production, construction, and transportation. These individuals form a crucial part of our economic fabric. So next, please. Uh, yeah. It is important to recognize that the vitality of small businesses is inter by the well-being of these 45,000 workers. Their contributions not only sustain the oil and gas industries, but also create a ripple effect, impacting businesses like mine that rely on a healthy and thriving local economy. The small businesses are the lifeblood of our community, and our collective success is intricately connected to the prosperity of these industries and the individuals they employ. As we discuss our policies that may shape our future, let us consider the intricate web that ties us all together, from energy prices to employment opportunities, from local businesses to broader economy. It is my hope that through thoughtful dialogue and collaboration, we can find solutions that uphold the interests of both small businesses and the vital workforce that fuels our state's economic engine. Uh, Next slide, please. So I want now to analyze the impact on small businesses in rising gas prices. And we can consider this from both sides, from the consumer side and from the small businesses side. Firstly, let's consider the consequences for consumers. As fuel prices climb, the financial burden of on individuals grows heavier. This directly translates into reduced spending in other areas of their lives. Everyday purchases that contribute to our local economy may take a hit as consumers find themselves with less discretionary income. The simple act of driving, a routine aspect of our lives, 
becomes a calculated decision as people aim to mitigate the increase in costs. Now, turning our attention to small businesses, the surge of fuel prices creates a ripple effect that touches us all. For businesses like mine and others reliant on daily vehicle operational, like construction, transportation, maintenance, and deliveries, the impact is particularly acute. These enterprises face increased overhead expenses and are forced to regulate their product pricing to cope with the rising costs of fuel. I want to add here that I personally offer free delivery for my products. So this will uh, influence a rising barrier for my future businesses. In an effort to maintain profit levels, some businesses may find themselves compelled to implement extra charges, affecting not only their bottom line, but also the pockets of consumers. As fuel becomes more expensive, companies may need to make tough decisions, such as limiting service and delivery areas to strategically reduce fuel costs. This, in turn, can reshape the landscape of how businesses operate and provide services within our community. So what we are seeing right now, it's not just numbers on gas stations. It's about the delicate balance of our local economy and the intricate relationship between consumers and small businesses. As we discuss policies that impact fuel prices, let us bear in the mind of broader implications on the everyday. So next slide, please. It's crucial to broaden our perspective when considering retail products to mitigate the impacts of hydraulic fracturing on oil and gas operations, we must prioritize items that align with principles of environmental sustainability, community health, and responsible consumption. In our pursuit of alternative solutions, let us emphasize the importance of embracing products that and practices that contribute positively to our environment. This includes supporting businesses that champion sustainable practices and offer eco-friendly alternatives. Also, there are community health that we have to consider. The well-being of our residents is paramount of our responsible consumers, and we should prioritize these kind of products. So um, next slide, please. Or, or you can stay there, please, in the back one. Yeah, um, I wanted to show also this graph and show the difference as technology changes. We have to keep up with that technology. Otherwise, there will be a gap in our business productivity. Um, I offer mostly products on hardware, such as computers, mobiles, security cameras, but I think that we also, as small businesses, we can innovate in these fields by uh, looking for other solutions that uh, come up because of the oil and gas impact. So we can go to the next one, please. Ms. Vaca, you, you've run over your time. Can you wrap up your presentation soon, please? Okay, okay, great. So um, we have some products that we can offer in our retails businesses as water filtration systems, air purifiers, eco-friendly cleaning products, and community health and safety rigs. So next slide, please. Yes, In conclusion, there is a compensation for business benefits, low cost energy and reduced taxes from the oil and gas industry benefit manufacturing and retail operations, enables retailers to provide cost-effective retail products mitigating impacts of a retail products that contribute to mitigating the impacts of oil and gas operations. And crucial role in addressing challenges. Retailers supporting the oil and gas industry play a crucial role in addressing challenges associated with fracturing, contribute to sustainability and community resilience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Uh, next, we're going to hear from the executive director of the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition. 
Good evening. I am representing the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, CVAQC. I'm the executive director of this nonprofit organization, which was founded in 2003. I was actually born and raised in the San Joaquin Valley. My doctoral research focused on issues around clean air and environmental justice in the Valley. Today, I would like to speak to you about some of the air quality impacts of oil and gas operations. So the CVAQ uh, is coalition is leads a partnership of more than 70 organizations. And you heard from one of those organizations, Earth Justice, earlier today. We exist to ensure that all communities of all races, cultures, classes, and creeds have the opportunity to be involved in the policy development and regulatory processes, improving regional health. Our 70 coalition members are shown in the next slide. And the following slide after that shows uh, a slide from our June 2022 workshop that our organization held on the impact of oil and gas operations. You can go to our website to view the workshop materials. This slide shows that there's almost 25,000 oil wells in San Joaquin Valley. And most of these oil wells are operated by big oil and they're making big profit from their operations. The next slide shows that half of the total PM 2.5 emissions are attributed, attributable to big oil. So you say, what are PM 2.5 emissions? PM 2.5 refers to fine inhalable particles. These are particles with diameters that are generally two and a half micrometers and smaller. So how small is two and a half micrometers? Think about a single hair from your head. The average human hair is about 70 micrometers in diameter, making it 30 times larger than the largest fine particle. These really small particles in the air can aggravate respiratory conditions, but they're also so small that the particles can enter our bloodstream and constrict our blood flow to the heart. The Central Valley Health Policy Institute found that on days when the PM 2.5 levels are high, that correlates to higher hospitalizations due to asthma attacks and heart attacks. Hence, there's a scientifically proven link between PM 2.5 pollution and adverse health effects. The San Joaquin Valley is the most polluted air basin in the entire nation for fine particle pollution or PM 2.5 with the city of Bakersfield being the worst in the nation. From Modesto to Bakersfield, the San Joaquin Valley has some of the highest concentrations of air pollution in the country, topping the nation for both worst ozone and fine particulate pollution. With this comes a very long list of related health, economic, socioeconomic, environmental impacts. The next slide shows the impacts on our community's health. According to the data from the California Air Resources Board, oil and gas production is a significant, significant contributor to our regional air pollution. In Kern County alone, one in 37 people died of chronic respiratory disease between 2013 and 2016. Contaminants that come from oil wells such as benzene and formaldehyde are known carcinogens so our communities are already being significantly impacted by these toxins. Children in our community are twice as likely to be diagnosed with asthma before age 18. Our families worry about their children playing outdoors in their community parks and even going outdoors during school recess. The science is very clear. The regulations are required to protect our children and our communities. We have so much pollution in our valley. All of us within all of the age groups have different health problems and the air quality makes those health problems worse. It is possible to have both a clean environment and a thriving economy in our valley. For information about making a difference in your community, please visit our website to learn how you can get involved. Our website is www.cal.cleanair.org and we'll help connect you with the air quality activists in your community so you too can join the fight for clean air in your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that enlightening uh, presentation and, <clears throat> and the ability to find out more information that we need. 
Our next speaker is Jack Renberg, who's a senior medical officer for the San Joaquin County Department of Public Health. Jack? All right, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Warren, for the introduction. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about why uh, my office uh, opposes the repeal of SB um, 1137. Uh, and effectively, my case rests on three relatively simple arguments. First, uh, we see within the medical lit literature that there's a high degree of correlation between proximity to oil and gas infrastructure and prenatal health issues, as well as respiratory issues um, in adults. Second, the standard threshold for uh, causality for public health policymaking um, is clearly met by the available evidence. Um, as we will discuss, uh, there do exist other possible thresholds that uh, for thresholds for causality that might be suited for other uses. Um, but in this case, we believe a causal link between proximity to oil and gas infrastructure and these health issues um, is, uh, can, be, can be stated. Uh, and finally, uh, we are against uh, the idea that a single setback distance um, can, can be deemed uh, medically safe. Uh, we don't believe that the, the medical literature uh, contains evidence that supports the establishment of uh, a single setback distance. Uh, instead, this distance must be um, determined by a um, collaborative process amongst all stakeholders, which we believe SB 1137 represents. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So to examine the first pillar of this argument uh, in slightly more depth, we'll be taking a look at the epidemi epidemiological evidence on the connection between oil and gas development proximity and adverse health outcomes. Uh, the state um, uh, uh, issued a, a study on this, this exact issue, um, which uh, looked through 19 uh, perinatal outcome studies that found links between oil and gas development exposure um, during pregnancy and adverse health outcomes in children. Uh, one of these studies uh, that gave us the, the figure present here on the right, which shows that um, in the case of um, pregnancies that occur in rural areas uh, near high um, production of oil and gas, uh, babies were 1.4 uh, or had an odds ratio of 1.4, which means they were roughly 40% more likely to have a low birth weight and uh, 1.2 odds ratio in regards to small, uh, being small for, for their uh, gestational age. Um, this is only one piece of evidence amongst uh, the, this larger body of, of, of work, um, but it does represent uh, the, the rather severe um, issue that we have on hand here, which is that uh, natal outcomes can be severely impacted by proximity to oil and gas infrastructure. Addition, additionally, the connection between the air pollutants that are commonly present at oil and gas sites, such as benzene, formaldehyde, and others, um, are also shown to be connected or highly correlated with adverse health, health outcomes amongst a, a very wide body of literature. And finally, uh, the, the study also revealed that proximity to oil and gas development seems to increase adverse respiratory health outcomes, such as asthma in adults. So in addition to the natal outcomes described before, uh, adults also suffer the impacts of proximity to oil and gas development. Uh, next slide, please. So all of uh, what we've said so far uh, largely concerns itself with establishing the strong correlation between proximity to oil and gas uh, infrastructure and these adverse health outcomes. However, establishing causality uh, is, is a different question. There are many potential reasons why the why this exists. Um, however, the common uh, and to kind of dive in deeper here, there are many different standards that exist for establishing a causal relationship um, in different different cases. For example, the FDA might use a different standard than what we find in some areas of, of civil law. However, in public health policymaking, uh, a common standard does exist, and that is the Bradford Hill criteria. The Bradford Hill criteria uses multiple factors to assess uh, the presence of a causal relationship. And on it, this issue, the standard is clearly met. 
These studies find that effect sizes are large, so the strength of the association is quite strong. Uh, the results are also consistent across multiple studies, multiple geographies, and across many different populations. The studies have been carried out accounting for possible confounding factors. And finally, there exists a clearly plausible biological mechanism that can explain the observed uh, association. As such, policymakers should operate under the assumption that a causal link between proximity to oil and gas infrastructure and adverse health outcomes exists. Well, oil and gas uh, proponents, or, or well, well um, opponents of SB one one three seven, might argue that might argue for a different standard of causality. Uh, it does not seem clear uh, to me that. Um, a different standard than the one that's commonly used for making policy decisions in the realm of public health should be applied here. Uh, next slide, okay. So while the medical literature does seem to clearly establish a causal relationship between proximity to this infrastructure and these adverse health outcomes, as we've described, uh, the evidence regarding the exact, um, the exact relationship between uh, distance and health outcomes is far less clear. So one study finds that infants have worse health outcomes when they're within one kilometer, which is roughly the setback distance of oil and gas infrastructure. Another finds that harmful emissions exist in higher concentrations within two kilometers of producing sites. And as we discussed before, um, we know that there is a strong correlation between the presence of these uh, emissions and adverse health outcomes. And so it seems that while we can say that being closer to this infrastructure is more harmful, it does not seem that the evidence suggests that there is a specific uh, setback distance that is guaranteed to be safe. Therefore, the setback distance decided on by policymakers cannot be decided simply based on medical testimony. I can, I, nor any other um, a researcher can give you a specific setback distance without conducting further studies. However, this does not invalidate the selection of the 3,200 foot setback by California policymakers. Opponents of 1137 have portrayed the setback distance as arbitrary because, as I said before, the evidence does not support this specific distance as safe. However, this is, I believe this is a willful misrepresentation of the policymaking process for what deciding a setback distance is. Uh, this distance represents a reasonable trade-off between medical and economic realities. And for that reason, our office supports SB 1137. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Renberg. <clears throat> our next speaker will be <clears throat> Marwa Alasanan, who's a senior medical officer, a uh, similar position for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marwa Sinan, senior medical officer in Los Angeles County, Department of Public Health. In this presentation, I will critically examine four studies that surveyed health indicators among residents living within a one kilometer radius of oil and gas wells in Los Angeles. Residing in proximity to oil and gas operations is associated with an elevated risk of health conditions, including cancer, preterm birth, and low weight birth. Los Angeles boasts one of the most extensive urban oil production regions in the United States. The county of 10 million residents is home to over 20,000 wells. Also, notably, Los Angeles lacks the regulatory buffer zones between oil extraction sites and residential areas, a measure which is commonly enforced in other oil producing regions. Consequently, a striking 75% of these wells are situated within 500 meters of sensitive areas such as daycares, schools, and playgrounds. Predominantly, the neighborhoods closest to these wells are Black and Hispanic communities, which have faced historical discrimination. The first study surveyed 800 neighbors 
from 200 households near wells in last seen gas oil field. This study uncovered a higher prevalence of asthma compared to the broader Los Angeles County population. The study measured lung functions, specifically lung capacity and strength, in 750 individuals of different ages. The lung capacity is the amount of air a person can exhale after taking a deep breath. And lung strength is how strongly a person can exhale. These metrics are reliable indicators of respiratory diseases, cardiovascular mortality, and overall mortality risk. Also, these metrics reveal diminished lung function in those living downwind of winds. This deterioration was comparable to the health detriments associated with living near freeways or experiencing secondhand smoke exposure, especially in women. The third study detected elevated levels of toxic metals like nickel and manganese in the toenails clippings of 200 residents living within one kilometer of a drilling site, which suggests, which suggests environmental contamination. The last study that I'm going to discuss is an assessment of blood pressure in 600 residents which indicated more pronounced effects of well proximity on diastolic blood pressure among non-smokers and those with a healthy body mass index. In summary, four studies acquired several health measurements from residents living within one kilometer of oil wells in Los Angeles. Collectively, these studies illustrate a significant link between residential proximity to oil and gas wells and negative health outcomes. The complexity of this issue is compounded by co confounding factors, such as pollution from nearby traffic, smoking habits, asthma, pesticides, and wildfires. Also, the lack of transparency from oil companies about the substances used in drilling and completion processes adds further challenges to understanding the full scope of health impact. Thank you all for listening. I will be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Alsani. Hello. Okay, our next speaker, um, we're getting close to the end, folks. Our next speaker is Alexander Kleiner, who's a representative of a group called Wilmington Concerned Residents Association. Thank you, so Alexander Nerolf, a representative of Wilmington Concerns uh, Residents Association. So thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity and I'll try to keep it short. So as a representative of the Wilmington Concerned Residents Association, a community of more than 50,000 people living near the pumping wells, I'm deeply troubled by the potential consequences of repealing SB 1137. The legislation was a crucial step towards safeguarding the health and well being of our community members. And its repeal would pose serious risks to our residents. Nearly 20% of Wilmington's total land area is taken by oil refineries, roughly 3.5 times more than the area that is dedicated to open and accessible green spaces. During the COVID 19 pandemic, Wilmington had one of the highest death rates in the Los Angeles County exacerbated by, ele by elevated levels of industrial pollution. Let me share with you firsthand accounts of some of our residents who have suffered due to the proximity of pumping wells to our neighborhood. So Ms. Martinez, a mother of three, has reported frequent episodes of nausea and dizziness. Her youngest child, a toddler, has developed chronic repository issues requiring multiple visits to the pediatrician. Mr. and Mr. Nigerian both have experienced skin irritation and persistent coughing since moving to our area. Their family doctor has advised them to limit other activities due to concerns about their quality. Lastly, Ms. Thompson, a dedicated teacher at the neighborhood elementary school, has noticed a significant increase in absenteeism among her students, many of whom suffer from asthma and other respiratory conditions. She believes that the pollutions emitted by the nearby wells are exacerbating the health problems. 
These are just few examples out of thousands of cases that have been reported to us. Next slide, please. I have a few requests on behalf of the Wilmington Concern Residents Association. So number one, we urge state and local legislatures to continue supporting SB 1137 and resist any efforts to repeal or undermine its provisions. Our community's health and safety depend on maintaining those critical protections against the harmful effects of oil and gas extraction. We call on all the regulatory agencies to ensure transparency and accountability in monitoring and enforcing compliance with SB 1137. We also request a meaningful opportunities for community engagement and input in decision-making process related to oil and gas operations in our area. We urge for a comprehensive health studies to be conducted to assess the long-term impacts of oil and gas extraction specifically on our community and to compensate our members for their enormous suffering and the price that they've been paying every day with their health. And lastly, we advocate for investment in and support for alternative energy solutions that reduce our, re our re reliance on fossil fuels and promote sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kleiner. Okay, our last speaker will be um, the Honorable Kevin Chen, who's the mayor of the city of Long Beach. Thank you, Professor Court. Um, as mentioned, I'll be speaking on behalf of the city of Long Beach tonight as their mayor, and uh, we'll also try to keep it relatively short. Thank you. So the stakes for Long Beach concerning the outcome of SB 1137 are extremely, extremely high. Specifically, Long Beach accounts for 60% of LA County's oil production, which is the most populous county in California. So any measure taken to curtail the oil production capacity of Long Beach should be due to the existence of clear and convincing evidence to suggest that the benefits of such a legislation would outweigh the potential setbacks. And here I'm arguing that that's simply not the case. Next slide, please. So SB 1137's main goal is to protect the health and safety of our citizens in California. As a mayor of Long Beach, this is also my goal for our residents. But the evidence to suggest that our current oil operations are a significant health detriment to the community uh, is logically flawed. The main health studies done by SAP have fundamental flaws in them, specifically Data collected on the negative health effects of hydraulic frac fracturing were collected from other states that generally also have weaker safety standards and emissions regulations. In these other states, oil production methods, including fracking, are fundamentally different from those that exist in California. Even more, many of these studies focused on uh, natural gas production, not oil production like we do in Long Beach. And finally, in our city, hydraulic fracking operations haven't been performed actually since 2013, and the city has no plans to pursue them in the future. Next slide, please. Now, Long Beach also has plans to initiate 100 new oil projects from the time period 2023 through 28, which means a rate of roughly 20 per year. These plans are vital for the economic prosperity of Long Beach due to their being an important source of high wage employment for the city's residents and a source of tax revenue for the city. Furthermore, suppose we are to believe the SAP health studies. In that case, they in fact indicate that drilling up to 25 new wells per year causes health effects below the significant thresholds for cancer risk at the fence line and below thresholds for acute, chronic, and cancer risk at all sensitive receptors. As such, the SAP study demonstrates that Long Beach's plan is not putting the health and well being of our citizens at significant risk. Final slide, please. In conclusion, supporting SB 1137 significantly dims the economic prosperity of cities throughout California, such as Long Beach, by dramatically reducing our oil, oil production operations. This isn't a trivial matter, and thus there's no reason to go through with such a proposal, given the logical weaknesses in the study supporting the view that such operations pose significant health risks for Californian residents. This view purely derives from an interpretation of the facts. That is, we need stronger conviction to go through with such a bill, with a bill such as SB 1137. 
We can't make a poorly informed decision that will so severely affect our workers without confidently benefiting those who are currently being harmed. In other words, a solution that is more tailored to the true nature of California's oil operations would be taken more seriously by the city of Long Beach. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Well, we've come to the to the end of our event, uh, miraculously close to the two hours that we we budgeted for the event. Um, I'd just like to make the observation that it was obvious to me that, irrespective of your views on SB eleven thirty seven for or against, um, uh, our student advocates, our, our our student presenters were good advocates for for their particular cause. I think they did an ex excellent job of doing that. And right now, I'd like to just give them all a big hand for all the um, hard work that they put in, which is obvious during the presentations. So we've allowed for perhaps 10 or 15 minutes for questions from one student to another or from, from our outside audience. So I'm going to open that up and, and probably close it in about 15 minutes or so. So if there's anybody who'd like to um, uh, ask questions of the presenters, I'd like to hear that. I'm not particularly interested in, I, I don't want to hear opinions from people. I would like for you to question our, our participants. Thank you. Anybody? I hear the the loud sound of silence. Is there anybody that would like to ask a question or make a remark? I'll ask a question. Um, so this is a question to the um, executives uh, uh, from the oil industry. Um, so if these setback require setback requirements. Uh, are enforced or you know uh, stay in place. What will you do with your business? Will you be leaving California and shutting down your operations? Uh, well, I mean, our oil uh, business is is only located in Southern California, so basically, I think uh, you know if this bill were to pass. Uh, we would likely end up, uh, you know, shutting down operations entirely and just uh, initiating the legal process to try and, uh, you know, recoup some of our investment. Thank you. Warren, now there's several hands raised. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I can't, I can't see the reactions on my thing. So, um, Oh, well, yeah, actually, I can. Let me see who this first person is. Um, Ms. Patel with CRPE. Well, that was one of the groups that was mentioned by um, uh, one of our speakers. Would you, would you like to ask a question? It was, yes, but I'm definitely here on my personal time, not on work time. But this is, I forgot that this was my automatic Zoom that logged in. But yes, I do work for CRPE in my day job. I have a question for the oil and gas companies um, in terms of um, transitioning, like um, what Kieran was saying was if that this law does remain in place and the future of oil and gas workers in Kern County, specifically Bakersfield, where I was born and raised, we've seen ERA lay off, ERA Energy, a joint venture between Exxon and Shell, lay off 100 workers last year after selling to a foreign company, as well as um, CRC, California Resources Corporation, lay off 60 workers the day after Labor Day. And my question is, with all of your idle oil and gas wells, if this bill goes into place, why not use your profits to now cap these wells and continue to keep them employed instead of laying them off? Okay. Either of you two execs want to respond to that? Yeah, so I can't comment uh, specifically to why Exxon or uh, the 
joint ventures with the other oil and gas companies decided to uh, divest of their assets in California um, and, you know, proceed with the unfortunate layoff. So I would suspect that the government's attitude towards uh, the oil and gas industry and the regulatory uh, framework that was being placed on them uh, made them uh, averse to continuing operations in the state. So um, that would be my comment with regards to uh, you know layoffs and other oil and gas companies leaving the state. Um, with regards to capping wells, um, and you know I uh, I think the the business that San Joaquin Oil Company in is uh, is pulling oil and gas resources out of the ground and then and, you know, processing them uh, for the energy needs of the country. I think uh, other oil and gas wells that remain uncapped, uh, one, it's not our business. And, and secondly, uh, I'm sure there's also a host of uh, remediation issues that we would expose ourselves to if we went and started spending shareholder money on uh, environmental cleanup. Um, so I think from a fiduciary responsibility, uh, we can't really engage with that. And additionally, from a liability standpoint, uh, we don't really want to be engaging with that. Um, let me interject something. I don't think, um, unfortunately, I don't think companies like the San Joaquin Oil Company or the Los Angeles Oil Company really have a choice. Um, the rules for abandoning wells are uh, regulations are well uh, uh, established in law, and CalGem uh, uh, right now is is very active in getting companies to comply with abandoning uh, wells that are that are in inactive, uh, very very forcefully. So whether whether they have extra profits or not is is kind of irrelevant. I think in this discussion they're going to have to do it, and they'll have to get their their funds someplace. So at any rate. Sorry, yeah, I, I understood it as other uh, companies' wells after they had left the state. Um, okay, let's see who else who else had a question. There was another hand up. Um, Karen, Karen Urso. But by the way, um, Ms. Patel, would you tell me what the acronym CRPE stands for? Yeah, it stands for Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. Thank you very much. Center for Race, Poverty, and Environment. Um, uh, not that this is important, only because our lawyers have also critiqued me on this, but it's Center on. I also linked our website, but it is not, it, it happens very often. But our, our lawyers have been very good at correcting me on the for versus the on sorry karen go ahead that's yeah well thank you that you're you've educated me um okay miss miss urso uh, with i'm a nurse and the same question you're uh, representing c n e h j would you mind telling me what that is sure california nurses for environmental health and justice for environmental I'm a public health nurse retired in Bakersfield, and it's been an excellent, excellent town hall meeting. So um, I think all the students should get an A. And okay. Well, thank you very much. And we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Yeah, please, please question, ask your question. My question is for Valeria and the small business owners and the uh, small, the county government uh, representatives. What impact do health insurance uh, illness and lost work days and lost family sick days have on small businesses. Valeria, are you around to respond? Who did, was there another person you had also had a um, question? Well, of? well, yeah, for for Mr. Jones too. He was uh, talking about. Foreign oil, several of your presenters spoke about foreign oil. And isn't it um, our own US companies that extract oil abroad, such as Chevron and 
Ex Exxon and Shell Oil, they're the ones who are doing the extracting in foreign countries. So sorry, my camera seems to have gone off. But, uh, you know, this is a question for you. Then why are the, why is the foreign oil produced under poorer environmental regulations? Are they not voluntarily following those? Barkley, you want to respond? If not, I could, I could weigh in on that. But... I don't think I totally understood it. So um, yeah, maybe if, if you can. Uh... Okay. Okay. Well, if I understand your question, which is a good question. Um, California has some of the strictest uh, oil and gas regulations in the country for for a variety of, of uh, situations, health and, and otherwise. Um, other countries don't. I mean, that's not to say every country doesn't, but, uh, you know, I know I've, I've been in the industry for almost 60 years and I've traveled to places all over the globe and I can tell you for instance, that countries in in South America, uh, their st their standards of oil and gas production are abysmal, in in many cases, and there's you know pollution and all all kinds of things. So I think the point that they were trying to make was that if a, a barrel of oil produced in California is produced under pretty strict regu regulations and good companies, good companies, and they're good and bad in this industry like any other do their best to mit mitigate you know like that bad operating practices uh if you replace that with a barrel of foreign oil produced in in say some country in Africa or South America you're not going to have the same standards and there will be pollution on a local level that we're you know this is kind of a global global issue well it it doesn't affect, may not affect us here, you know, like that. It certainly affects somebody somewhere else. So if you're a, a globalist and, you, you know, you care about the world, then that, that's a trade-off that I, I think that's the point that they were trying to make. Thank you. You're welcome. And thanks for coming. Uh, I think we have some actual questions in the chat room. Let's see. Um, well, let's see. No, maybe not. So is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to ask a question? We certainly appreciate that. If not, it's been a long evening. Um, once again, I want to thank our students and our staff. Uh, I, I'm continually impressed with the, the quality of research and, and the uh, ability of our students to articulate com complicated subjects and stuff. And once again, this is the ninth year of doing this. They've, they've done a great job. And I'd like to invite you to our town hall meeting, which will take place in February of 2025. Okay, everybody have a good evening.